Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, which is administered by US Aging. My name is Meredith Hanley. I serve as the Director of Community Capacity Building at US Aging, and I oversee the Engaged Resource Center. Our webinar today is called Social Engagement and Mental Health, Successful Programs and Interventions. During the webinar, the Illinois Coalition on Mental Health and Aging will provide a framer on how remaining socially engaged and connected positively impacts mental health and what organizations interested in developing programs that address this issue should know. And attendees will also hear from the Rogue, uh, Rogue Valley Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging and the University of Rochester Medical Center on programs that promote um, social engagement and positive mental health outcomes. Just a couple um, quick housekeeping items. All attendees of this webinar are in listen only mode for the duration of the webinar. So that means that your microphone or phone will be muted, but there are still ways you can engage with our speakers today. You can submit questions for the presenters at any time throughout the webinar by clicking the Zoom question and answer or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then just type in your question and click submit. And we do plan to save time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. There's also the chat feature where you can engage with each other and introduce yourselves if, if you wish. Um, you can also click the chat button and submit a message to the host, um, us here at US Aging, if you need technical support and we'll do our best to help you. Also a common question, um, that I'll answer at the front, but happy to answer it again if there are any more questions, but the webinar will be recorded and we'll share a link with you in the next few days if, if, um, if you would like to check out the recording. Next slide. For those who are using a screen reader and perhaps want to silence unwanted chatter in the chat and Q&A boxes, you can activate the speech on demand feature by pressing insert space bar and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. Um, you can also view closed caption subtitles, watch a live transcript of the webinar, or adjust the size of um, subtitle text. And to control closed captions, click on the CC live transcript button in the control bar at the bottom of the Zoom window. And you, you can again um, not notify us if you'd like techno technical assistance by messaging us in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand um, using the Zoom platform. Um, you can also raise your hand by pressing Alt plus Y on the keyboard is an additional way to do that if you're if you'd like to, to to get our attention. And again, we'll do our best to help. Next slide. Just a little background about U.S. Aging. U.S. Aging is the national association representing and supporting the network of area agencies on aging and advocating for the Title VI Native American Aging programs. U.S. Aging has a number of initiatives that can be found on our website, usaging.org. Uh, we administer the Aging and Disability Business Institute. We co-lead the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center with Easter Seals. We lead an initiative called Dementia Friendly America. And we also operate the Elder Care Locator and the Disability and Access Line Dial, um, among many more efforts, again, which can be found on our website, usaging.org. Next slide. We also administer Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, which is a national effort. It's funded by the US Administration for Community Living. And we work to increase the social engagement of older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers. And much of our work focuses on identifying and disseminating information about emerging trends. Um, we develop resources and replication tools and best practices for social engagement programs. And we're guided by a project advisory committee with representatives from 18 organizations and resource centers who help to guide and shape our work. Next slide. Uh, now for um, the exciting part. I'm pleased to introduce four fantastic speakers for today's webinar. We're joined by Mike O'Donnell, a member of the board of directors with the Illinois Coalition on Mental Health and Aging. Uh, Constance Wilkerson, Senior and Disability Services Director with the Rogue Valley Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging. Susan J. Rounds, Behavioral Health Specialist, also with Rogue Valley Council of Governments AAA. And Kim Van Orden, an Associate Professor 
with the University of Rochester Medical Center. So with that, Mike, I will turn it over to you. Hi, this, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, everyone. Well, uh, next slide, please. Well, we're coming back after two years of coping with the pandemic. We are reconnecting with family, friends, and community life. And Mike, if you would like, you're welcome to turn on your webcam. Okay. But we never really left. We learned how to adapt and we connected with others virtually. Now we can meet again face to face. But how did we manage to stay together while staying apart? And how has this experience affected our social engagement and our mental health? Where do we go from here? Next slide, please. Let's frame the topic of social engagement and mental health. We'll define our terms, learn the link between social engagement and mental health, find out what research tells us, identify mental health concerns affecting older adults, learn about programs and interventions that promote social engagement and mental health, and show how we can apply what we've learned and identify collaborations and coalitions that are making a difference. Next slide. Loneliness is the perception of social isolation. Social isolation is the objective lack of or limited social contact. Social engagement is interacting with others, feeling connected, doing purposeful activities, and maintaining meaningful social relationships. Social connections are structural, functional, and quality aspects of how individuals connect to each other. Social support is the actual or perceived availability of information and emotional support. Mediators are factors that help explain how social isolation or loneliness affects health outcomes. And moderators are factors that affect the size or direction of the effect of social isolation or loneliness on health. Next. Let's look more closely at mediators identified by the CDC. Loneliness, social isolation, and social support are linked to changes in cardiovascular, neuroendocrine and immune function, as well as the physiological stress response. A lack of social connections is linked to higher levels of inflammation, a biological cause for the association of social isolation and loneliness with a variety of negative health outcomes. Social isolation and loneliness are linked to decreased quality of sleep, which affects physical health, including cardiovascular disease, weight gain, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and increased risk for mortality. Next. Let's look more closely at moderators identified by the CDC. Demographic factors. Social isolation and loneliness may carry a higher risk among those under 65 relative to those over 65, but there's no reliable gender differences at this point. Higher quality and more numerous relationships are associated with protective health effects and a lower risk of mortality. Having a poorer quality and fewer relationships is associated with harmful effects on health, including a higher risk for morbidity and mortality, poor treatment adherence, and poor health-relevant biological responses. Decreasing social isolation may reduce risk if attention is not paid to the quality of the relationships. Thus, indicators of quality need to be included in our assessments. Next, let's identify the psychological, psychiatric and cognitive factors. Well, psychiatric disorders such as major depression, generalized anxiety disorders, and social anxiety disorder have been shown to increase the risk of developing loneliness. Social isolation and loneliness are more common in older adults with depressive and anxiety disorders. The relationship between depression and loneliness is bidirectional, and the impairments related to dementia predispose an individual to feelings of loneliness and caregivers, of course, are also at risk for loneliness. Next. What are the common mental health concerns among older adults? It's estimated that 20% of people age 55 and older experience some type of mental health concern. Conditions may include depression, anxiety, and cognitive impairment. Mental health issues may be implicated as a factor in cases of suicide. Older men have the highest suicide rate of any age group. Next, please. Let's take a closer look at depression. Depression is the most prevalent mental health problem among older adults. It's a mood disorder characterized by feelings of sadness, anxiety, and or apathy lasting for at least two weeks and impacts a person's ability to function normally. Depression can lead to 
impairments in physical, mental, and social functioning. And depressive disorders adversely affect the course and complicate the treatment of other chronic diseases. How can depression be treated? Depression is a highly treatable condition. We urge older adults to report their depressive symptoms to their primary care physicians to rule out other causes such as medication and other health conditions. We encourage them to request a referral to a mental health professional if possible. Treatment approaches may include antidepressant meds, counseling, talk therapy, behavior modification, psychotherapy, or in extreme cases, electroconvulsive therapy for persons with severe symptoms. Next, please. There are evidence-based programs for older adults with depression, including PEARLS, which educates older adults about what depression is and helps them develop skills or self-sufficiency and active living. It's delivered by trained counselors and takes place in six to eight sessions over the course of four to five months in their home. Information is available from the University of Washington. Healthy ideas means identifying depression and empowering activities for seniors in an evidence-based program that integrates depression awareness and management into existing case management provided to older adults. And I've provided you with the link. Let's discuss anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder is the most common anxiety disorder among older adults. People with GAD may fear the worst in every situation. They may constantly feel on edge and in a high state of alert. They may feel a lack of control over their emotions. GAD tends to be more common among older women compared to older men, particularly in the event of divorce, separation, or the loss of a spouse or partner. Other types of anxiety include social anxiety disorder, phobia, um, excuse me, other types of anxiety include social anxiety disorder, phobia, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Next, please. How is anxiety treated? It's not come something you can will away. It's a chronic health condition that requires treatment. We encourage older adults to contact their primary care doctor, request a referral to a mental health professional, and ask about talk therapy, medication, or a combination of those. Many anxiety sufferers benefit from exposure therapy, that is tackling fears head on to become more comfortable with those activities or objects. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps identify harmful anxiety provoking thought patterns and works on changing them. Next, please. Well, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect older adult mental health? During the pandemic, rates of anxiety and depression increased among older adults. Younger generations reported higher rates of anxiety and depression compared to older adults. Factors influencing the risk of mental illness in older adults during the pandemic included sex, age group, location, living situation, socioeconomic status, and medical and psychiatric comorbidities. Strategies and interventions for older adults, caregivers, and healthcare providers mitigated the effects of social isolation on the older adult population. It's also noted in research that personality traits of wisdom have been reported to combat loneliness. Wisdom is known to derive, excuse me, to drive empathy and compassion, behaviors which improve emotional regulation, acceptance of uncertainty, and spirituality. Wisdom and its pro-social actions may be an age-dependent source of resilience during the pandemic. Next, please. Let's take a look at social engagement and healthy aging. The World Health Organization defines healthy aging as the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well being in older age. An important component is to build and maintain relationships, as well as contribute to society, which means to engage in both individual and society level activities. Social engagement provides a sense of belonging, social identity, and fulfillment. Socially meaningful relations are associated positively with mental health, mental well being, and quality of life. Social engagement is associated with the lower risk of heart disease, cancers, and mortality. Next, please. Let's look at social engagement and cognitive health. The Global Council on Brain Health has found that social engagement helps maintain thinking skills and slows cognitive decline in later life. And people who are socially engaged have a lower risk of cognitive decline and dementia. However, there is not yet sufficient scientific evidence to conclude 
that social engagement can reduce the risk of brain diseases that cause dementia. Next, please. What can we do to optimize social engagement? Focus on relationships and activities that we enjoy. Turn to those who can help us to engage socially. Keep a circle of family, friends, and neighbors. Make new connections, pursue new activities. Overcome barriers such as transportation and neighborhood safety. Communicate in person by telephone, email, and social media. Maintain social connections with people of different ages and volunteer to serve others in the community. Let's focus in a little bit on volunteering, something that I'm currently involved in with our Faith in Action organization in my hometown. Volunteering reduces stress and increases positive, relaxed feelings by releasing dopamine. Volunteers feel a sense of meaning and appreciation, which can have a stress-reducing effect. Volunteers have a sense of purpose when volunteering in areas that they find meaningful. Older volunteers experience greater increases in life satisfaction and self-esteem. And volunteering increases social interaction and builds a support system based on common interests. Next, please. I'd like to share our experience in Illinois in implementing programs and interventions to address social isolation among older adults and promote social engagement. We, I sent the uh, full report to um, US Aging today and it's, it will be available to you. Starting in 2020, the Illinois Department on Aging and its 13 area agencies on aging collaborated on an initiative to address social isolation and loneliness. Our General Assembly appropriated $1 million for this initiative. The department allocated funds to the area agencies to administer demonstration projects in 13 PSAs. With funding from the Retirement Research Foundation on Aging, Illinois Aging Services comprising the AAAs contracted with the University of Chicago and CJE Senior Life to conduct a process evaluation. Five AAAs serving older adults and caregivers in urban, suburban, and rural communities participated in the program evaluation. Next slide. We'll show you the distribution of the 13 area agencies on aging. Areas 2, 5, 7, 8, and 13 participated in the evaluation. Next, please. Let me tell you more about the process evaluation itself. The project assessed changes from before to during the pandemic. Assessment showed the flexibility of the AAAs in adjusting programs. Findings will inform the department and the AAAs about targeting resources in the future project used a novel text message based data collection strategy to monitor loneliness levels over time. Experience will guide us in modifying and testing this approach in the future. Next, please. The project evaluated a variety of programs. I won't take the time to list them all or to discuss them all with you right now. Uh, the details of each of these projects are in the report that is available to you. Next slide, please. The project also included interviews with older adults. 102 older adults were selected. Next slide, please. 102 older adults were selected for interviews from programs designed to reduce social isolation. The interviews were completed with 60 program users, including 12 caregivers. People were asked how the pandemic changed their ability, their daily routines and social contacts. Benefits and impacts of programs included social interaction and conversation, Social contact, meeting people, feeling a sense of community, camaraderie, commonality, and coming together. Acceptance, openness, and mutual respect among participants. Learning what is happening in the community. Meeting people they knew from the past provided a sense of history and opportunities to develop relationships and just sharing things in common. Next, please. How did the COVID-19 pandemic impact their mental well-being? Well, over half discussed either positive or negative aspects of their mental well-being. 40% experienced loneliness, isolation, depression, or anxiety. Such individuals missed their prior routines or social connections. Some had experienced multiple deaths of family, friends, and interviews talked about hearing too much bad news about the pandemic and racial violence, not wanting to watch TV anymore, and needing other activities to distract them from negative thoughts. Some explicitly mentioned that they experienced anxiety or depression during the pandemic. Some had managed to, to manage such feelings in the past, but those feelings returned or were exacerbated by not being able to get out and see people. Other interviewees stated that experiencing the pandemic did not affect their mental well-being. Such individuals described themselves as being comfortable alone, did not experience a change in their routines or found ways to adapt to the pandemic. 
Lastly, what was the impact of the programs on mental well being? Programs helped to reduce feelings of isolation or loneliness, gave them more positive outlooks, helped them cope or manage negative feelings, learned how to care for themselves. Some mentioned exercise programs, for example, as being very helpful, giving them the opportunity to focus on spirituality and mindfulness, gained or practiced social skills. For example, one person volunteered to lead a class and found it exciting to prepare for the class and lead the group discussion, making more efforts to socialize and meet people than they had in the past, either to overcome personal tendencies to not socialize or to address mental health issues or deal with isolation. Lastly, what coalitions and coalitions uh, and collaborators are needed to deliver programs and reach older adults at risk for social isolation? The evaluation showed the importance of collaboration with the state agencies serving older adults and persons with disabilities, the AAAs, community-based programs serving older adults, their caregivers and families, senior centers, senior nutrition programs and transportation programs, centers for independent living, behavioral health providers, public libraries, faith-based organizations, organizations serving culturally diverse populations, universities, community colleges, and foundations supporting research and community services, and of course, state and local coalitions on mental health and aging. Last slide, please. I've provided you with some links to uh, the Centers of Disease Control Resources. National Council on Aging is posting many behavioral health um, resources on their website, uh, as well as the National Coalition on Mental Health and Aging, the Illinois Aging Services Incorporated, and the Illinois Coalition on Mental Health and Aging. Pleasure to be with you. I'll be with you later for questions and answers. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I'm Susan J. Rounds, a behavioral health specialist with Senior and Disability Services at the Rogue Valley Council of Governments. I really appreciate Michael's presentation. It really segues nicely into ours. I'm excited to share information today about our options for people to address loneliness program, um, along with our Senior and Disability Services Director, Constance Wilkerson, who will now share some information about our area agency on aging. Next slide. To set the context, Susan and I work for the Rogue Valley Council of Governments Senior Disability Services. The Rogue Valley Council of Governments is both a council on government serving 24 member jurisdictions, including counties, cities, special districts, and higher educational institutions. <clears throat> and it's also an area agency on aging, which means we collaborate with a wide variety of stakeholders. As an area agency on aging, our service area is two Southern Oregon counties. One county has several urban areas, whereas the other county has only one main urbanized area and is predominantly rural. As you can see from the map, both counties touch the California border. However, these areas in California are also rural. Both counties are located at a large distance from Oregon's population centers, where there are more resources and services available to clients. The southernmost parts of our two counties are a four to five hour drive to Portland, a three to four hour drive to Salem, the state capital, and a two to three hour drive to Eugene. Being geographically isolated from the services and resources available in urban centers has created the necessity for us as a AAA to be more innovative and imaginative as we help our clients navigate resources. Next slide, Susan. Um, a significant lesson that I've learned about loneliness and isolation, and it um, keys right into what Michael was talking about, is the profound impact um, both have on our health and well-being, which is why I included this quote from national researcher Dr. Stephen Cole, who studies the biology of loneliness and says, you know, loneliness acts as a fertilizer for other diseases accelerating plaque buildup um, in our cardiovascular system, cancer cell growth, and brain inflammation. Loneliness and isolation are not benign conditions and in fact take a large toll on the health and well-being of our older adults. Next slide. So here you see our flyer 
It asks about feelings of loneliness and isolation and lets consumers know that OPAL, again, the Options for People to Address Loneliness program, is free, includes six sessions, and is for adults age 60 and older or for people with disabilities age 18 and older. Next slide. So our OPAL sessions, you know, during COVID, we were limited to having to offer sessions by phone and telehealth. Now we're able to also offer visits in home. Um, we, our sessions usually last an hour. Our key components include weekly scheduling of activities, connecting to resources, and action planning around goals. Next slide. So it's kind of important to understand that the timeline for how OPAL developed. Um, in August, we lost funding for our behavioral health program for older adults with depression called the Program to Encourage Active and Rewarding Lives, or PEARLS, which Michael had referred to in his presentation. Um, during that same summer of 2020, with COVID, the state requested proposals for programs that would reduce loneliness and isolation among seniors during COVID. Our managers asked our behavioral health team to develop such a pilot program using interventions from the many previous behavioral health programs that we've offered, including PEARLS. Next slide. So our behavioral health team consulted with key experience partners, including the Health Promotion Research Center at the and a clinical psychology department professor at the University of Washington. And we also reviewed the research literature. We blended new and previous program interventions that we thought would have the most impact on reducing loneliness and isolation based on our research and consultations. Our goals were to create a program that would help decrease a participant's level of loneliness and isolation, be brief in duration, and be client-centered. Next slide. So the key components in developing Pearl, um, OPAL, <laughs> we have three. Um, behavior activation, options counseling, and action planning. So behavior activation involves coaching participants in re-engaging in enjoyable physical and social activities every week. So what does that look like? It looks like having participants first make a list of activities that they enjoy, reading the difficulty and easiestness of that activity, and then they create a schedule of these activities. Behavior activation looks like my client. She's 80 years old. She's a widow. And for the past year, she has stayed in her PJs most days and dropped all of her social activities due to heart issues and trying to adjust to being a widow after 60 years of marriage. Since creating two weekly schedules of activities in our last two sessions, she's gone to her first family gathering in several months um, for her granddaughter's baby shower, her first widow's group, she went to this last Monday after not going for over a year. And she started listening to music more and saying that it's bringing her a lot of comfort. So with behavior activation, change happens from the doing versus talk therapy where change is happening internally. Um, behavior activation, options counseling, and action planning are the reasons that OPAL can be replicated because staff can be trained and learn how to provide all three, especially behavior activation, which is a simple, well-researched and powerful intervention. Options counseling is a client-centered approach for connecting participants to resources, emphasizing education, choice and client goals. And action planning helps clients focus on doable short-term goals. Next slide. So as you can see here, um, our sessions include a screening, an intake, um, session one through six. And um, what we really learned was that we really needed to add a session for screening um, and include in that a screening for depression, anxiety, unmanaged complex mental health conditions like bipolar, um, alcohol abuse, as well as memory when indicated. The expanded screening helped um, identify participants who needed a higher level of mental health care or cognitive support. Um, in our intake session, we do a brief assessment about um, loneliness and isolation. It helps both of us, the counselor and the participant, ex um, understand what the person's experiencing and what might be the cause of loneliness and isolation. In um, sessions, 
one through six, we're helping people plan weekly activities. We're helping assess what might be some um, success or challenges to those and problem solving how to be more active. And we also look at our resources that they identify. We do follow up on those resources and help folks be able to attain some of their goals. Next slide. When we came to implementation, we were awarded the state grant in October 2020 for OPAL. Um, and we began outreach to our own partners first. A significant step that helped us um, create more referrals is we had CARES money that we were providing emergency supplies to. And we were able to ask folks on those calls, um, do they feel or have a sense of loneliness or isolation? And when they said yes, they would go to our referral list and that built our initial referral list. Um, and we've also been doing community presentations. Next slide. Um, in our first eight months, we needed to provide our sessions by phone. And um, one of our first les lessons we also thought realized was how quickly we needed to make referrals to social connections, including warm lines and phone buddy programs. We've actually started providing such referrals even earlier, both um, in our screening sessions and sometimes to those on our wait list. Um, now I'm going to hand this over to Connie, who will talk to you about sustainability, replication, and outcomes. Next slide, please. Great. We learned that in order for the OPAL program to be sustainable, we need the backing of our leadership and governing board to braid funding sources such as private trust, federal and state grants, and local funding. We also needed to hire capable staff that had some behavioral health background or experience with social work or case management and resource referrals. And we also learned that we must continually research other funding sources. Quickly after launching OPAL, it became apparent that we had to design a system change to capture clients' progress. Next slide, please. COVID's impact on the need for resource support and navigation was enormous. As the program progressed, we learned that a key component is the use of local resources and how use of these resources serves as a type of intervention by helping to embed the participants in their own local community. The use of resources also lays the foundation for continuing to further build the participant safety net. Next slide, please. A wide variety of resources is necessary to address the participants' social isolation and loneliness and associated needs. Resources range from emergency needs such as food, shelter, utilities, and transportation to health care and mental health care to connection to such opportunities as senior centers and garden clubs, volunteering opportunities, and outdoor recreation. Next slide. Key to the replication of this program is the use of the three components Susan mentioned, behavioral activation, options counseling and resource coordination, and action planning. We learned that it is vitally important for the OPAL coaches themselves to become aware of their own level of loneliness and social isolation and to practice being social and active with enjoyable physical and social activities. This could include increasing their circle of friends or increasing contact with family, joining a group, exercising more, etc. If you choose to replicate the program, you will need to spend a lot of time networking within your own communities to discover all the resources that are available and then figure out ways to address the gaps in resources. Further tips for replication include maintaining your leadership support, utilizing a variety of funding resources, hiring capable staff, and maintaining an adequate data system. Next slide. I will touch briefly on our initial outcomes. You will note that the same number of participants is not found within each segment of the circle. That is because we built the database after the launch of OPAL and we made adjustments during the first few months. To date, we have documented that 67% of our clients feel less lonely, 
76% witnessed a decline in isolation, 75% experienced a decrease in depressive symptoms, and 36% experienced a decrease in anxiety. Next slide. We have received lots of feedback from our clients. Here is a small sample that indicates as our clients participate, they feel seen, they are better able to focus, they become unstuck and able to apply self-care to make a positive change. As one client stated, if this program works for me, it surely will work for others. My depression is lifted with the anticipation of the coach's visits. Thank God that the program exists. Next slide. Susan and I welcome any and all questions. Please use this contact information to reach us. Thank you. This concludes our part of the presentation and you will now hear from Kim. Great, thank you, Constance. Um, I'm excited to tell you today about the program called Social Engaged Coaching that I developed with my colleagues at the University of Rochester and in collaboration with our community partner, Lifespan of Greater Rochester. Um, next slide, please. Um, so all of the work I do is team science. So I want to acknowledge my amazing collaborators and colleagues at the University of Rochester. Um, I'm lucky enough to have funding from the National Institute on Aging to do this work, including work with uh, dementia caregivers through the Rochester Roybal Center for Social Ties and Aging Research, which is the Rockstar Center. And you can see my group there um, engaging in our own social connectedness. Um, next slide, please. So what I want to tell you about is social engaged coaching and briefly I want to tell you where we were coming from in developing this program and our goal was to uh, take evidence based programs for depression treatment in older people and make them uh, relevant to reducing loneliness and increase belongingness and reduce perceived burden in older people as a means of preventing suicide in later life. And so what you can see on the diagram is we wanted to target those factors because they are known to be associated with uh, suicide deaths in older people. So our goal is to take a coaching program and use that to help people increase social engagement as a means to then change the internal perceptions of loneliness, belonging, and perceived burden, which should then impact our clinical outcomes, including suicide ideation, depression, depression and increased quality of life. Um, next slide, please. So um, there's a lot on this slide, but luckily my prior presenters shared a lot of this, so we'll be able to get through it quickly. Um, engaged coaching, social engaged coaching was developed from something called engaged psychotherapy which itself was developed from problem solving therapy and uses behavioral activation. So you heard from both Michael and Susan uh, talking about pearls. Um, engaged psychotherapy uses many of the same uh, techniques that you'd use in pearls, including problem solving and behavioral activation. And so you can see on the right, the steps in conducting engaged psychotherapy are action planning. So we've already talked about that. Selecting a meaningful activity, brainstorming, selecting a feasible activity and developing concrete steps that a person can take. And so we know that behavioral activation is a key mechanism in reducing depression. It involves pleasant activity scheduling and problem solving. You have some links there if you'd like to read more about Engage. What Engage does is it streamlined that process and made it even easier for uh, coaches to learn and for clients to learn as well. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. So what I have here, um, there is a QR code. If you want to scan that with your phone, it will take you to a free article. I'm also happy, happy to share the, the article as well um, via email. And it is our article that describes how we took engaged psychotherapy for depression and tweaked it just a little bit to address social engagement in particular, uh, looking at loneliness and isolation. And so what we did there is we had coaches help clients select activities that are social in nature to target social disconnectedness specifically. And the reason we think we needed to do that is if you've done this type of coaching or pearls with people who are experiencing depression, uh, social activities are often the most potent, but they aren't the ones people tend to pick initially in part because they tend to be more challenging. 
than doing a pleasant activity on your own or a physical activity. So engaged coaching is a way of really helping people focus on those social activities. And what you see on the slide is the Engage Action Planner. So we're seeing um, a common ingredient across interventions for loneliness and social engagement that action planning can be very useful. And so that's what our action planner in Engage looks like. You could go to the next slide. So I'm gonna tell you very briefly about two studies that we did, and I'm, I'm mindful of the need for us to stop soon so we can do Q&A. Um, so more details are available in the article online, but this first study was the first one we did with engaged coaching. Um, and just to orient you, the figure on the right is what's called a consort diagram for a clinical trial. And it's really there just so you can see the number of people that we enrolled and the number who stuck with the intervention. And our goal with this study was to see does social engaged coaching um, reduce suicide risk among older adults who report social disconnection? So in this study, we took uh, 62 primary care patients who were age 60 and older, and they had to endorse either loneliness or perceived burden in the past month. And those are factors that are associated with suicide risk. Uh, we did exclude people who had cognitive impairment that would make it hard to do the program that was a MOCA score of less than 20. That would be approximately a level someone might have if they had dementia. Um, we did only work with people who lived in the community just because the social engagement um, activities that they could engage in would be a little bit different. So with this trial, we randomized people, flip of a coin, to do a social engaged coaching for uh, 10 sessions or to continue with their primary doctor, primary care doctor and not have an additional intervention. And you can see that if you look at that diagram on the right, that we didn't lose people to follow up. People stayed in the study, which is really good, um, and tended to uh, do most of their sessions as well. So you could go to the next slide. So some details about social engaged coaching. What are the active ingredients? So we think it's that it helps clients increase their awareness of the importance of social connection. Um, it teaches some problem solving skills to address barriers to social engagement. So we know that it's not just that people aren't aware of things that they could do, but often barriers, psychological barriers will come up. Things like having negative thoughts, uh, making negative predictions, apathy or anxiety. Um, sometimes it is practical barriers um, like difficulties leaving the home. Um, it might be sensory impairment, difficulty with hearing or vision. Sometimes there are caregiving roles. Sometimes someone relocated to a senior living community and doesn't know anyone. So it also teaches problem solving to address all of those different types of barriers and then provides behavioral practice with social engagement. So we envision social engaged coaching as up to 10 weekly individual coaching sessions that can be done on Zoom, it can be done over the phone, it can be done in person, we've done it in the home as well. Uh, we will have a manual available soon on our Rockstar website and I can provide that link as well. Um, in terms of who has done the coaching in the past, we've had geriatric care managers, social workers and clinical psychologists as well. You could go to the next slide. So what did we find? Um, this was a study that was pre-COVID. I will tell you the next one was during COVID. Uh, participants appreciated coaching. So the mean number of completed sessions was 8.5 out of 10, which is pretty darn good for um, a behavioral intervention. And the vast majority did a full dose, which is six or more sessions. We also found that compared to uh, no intervention at all, um, when the participants who were randomized to social engaged coaching had improved depression scores after 10 sessions and increased quality of life more than care as usual. So that's um, a really high bar for our program. So we were really glad to see that. We'll say from that study, it wasn't clear if social engaged coaching um, affected loneliness or belonging because both of our groups improved. So the care as usual, people got phone calls from our research assessors to check in on them. And so both groups improved in terms of belonging um, and perceived burden. So something for us to think about is how um, when we don't have a comparison group, we can't really tell if it's the coaching or just the contact that reduces loneliness. And for this study, we found um, only specific benefits of coaching for depression and quality of life, 
though this was for individuals who had clinically significant loneliness at the beginning. So that's good news. And so if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so how did coaching help? I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but this is from the article that I gave you the link for. So participants told us three main ways that coaching helped. One was learning about the importance of connection and really understanding it for themselves. Um, practicing being proactive with their social relationships instead of waiting for others to come to them. And then having specific work around addressing their own personalized barriers, whether those were psychological or practical. And you go to the next slide. Um, so what we learned from that, social engaged coaching was feasible and acceptable. Um, we were left with a question though. So why didn't belonging and perceived burden change and why didn't loneliness change? So one hypothesis is that uh, people needed more time and more practice. So in an upcoming study, we're going to offer booster sessions. We also wondered about more tailored strategies. Um, so our group is very heterogeneous. There were so many different reasons that people were experiencing loneliness. And so we wondered if we took a more um, homogenous group and offered very tailored uh, strategies, would that be helpful? And so I'm gonna briefly tell you about the subsequent study that we did uh, called Engaged Coaching for Caregivers. And then I'll briefly mention, we have a study upcoming where we're going to use more sensitive assessments of social behaviors, um, having people report what they're doing via smartphone. So we're looking forward to that. So you can go to the next slide. So um, this is engaged coaching for caregivers. And so it's um, social engaged coaching, but focused around specific barriers that dementia caregivers experience. And so the key activity engaged, we didn't touch it, it's action planning, it's the same. Um, our psychoeducation on the importance of social connection looks a little different because it's focused on the caregiving situation and the ways in which being a dementia caregiver can reduce our feelings of belonging. It can reduce social support sometimes, even though you might be spending a lot of time with another person, the person you're caring for. And so on the right, that is a handout that we give to all of our engaged coaching participants that gives them examples, vignettes, of how different people's social worlds have been impacted by dementia caregiving so that they can think about their own personalized barriers and we can tailor it using coaching. And so we often will address um, changes in other relationships that are impacted by caregiving. We think about how responsibilities and day-to-day -day tasks can impact the ability to leave the home or be able to spend time with others. We also talk about the changing roles that accompany caregiving and how that can impact relationships. And so we have an animation, if you could put have that one come up. Yep. Um, and so you can see um, an example here um, of a barrier that a caregiver sh shared with us is, well, I'll make time to visit with friends when my wife is done with PT and things are back to normal. And so it's kind of a hesitation to take time for themselves. And so that's something we're able to address in coaching. I think there's one more animation, a different example. Yep. Um, so another thing that we address in engaged coaching is the idea of being uh, proactive in reaching out. And so this is something someone told us who finished coaching and how she found it was really helpful each week to focus on her own social relationships and really reach out. Uh, that sometimes when we start feeling down or lonely, we kind of like hide within ourselves and stop reaching out. Um, and so Engage Coaching helped her with that. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so I am gonna skip this slide and come back to it if people have questions about what this looks like um, specifically. This is a case example. So if folks have questions during Q&A, we can come back to it. Uh, but go ahead and go to the next slide. Yep, so study findings of that one. This was not a randomized trial. So everyone in this study, it was 30 people who were caregivers. They all received coaching. They got eight sessions of um, engaged coaching for caregivers. They were all lonely at the beginning. We found significant reductions from the beginning of the study until after session eight. And we saw significant reductions in loneliness and isolation and significant improvements in their satisfaction with their social activities. So we were really excited by that. We think that maybe engaged coaching can have 
better effects on loneliness when it's very tailored to the specific situations that are disrupting social engagement. And so our next step is we're gonna be confirming it with a randomized controlled trial. We're also gonna be rolling this out with our local, local area agency on aging to train them in how to do it and figure out the best ways of um, training people in providing engaged coaching. So you can go to the next slide and then I will finish up. So our summary, engaged coaching has been appreciated by the older adults who have received it. Um, and those are people who report significant loneliness, improved depression, improved quality of life, and also improved loneliness in dementia caregivers. It was designed to be easy to learn by coaches. Um, we successfully delivered it over Zoom during the pandemic, as well as phone. Uh, we do email and mail a participant manual so they can follow along if we're not in person. Um, a manual for coaches and a participant workbook is available. We'll be putting that on our website and a training program for care managers is under development. Um, if you wanted to um, deliver engaged coaching, the time commitment for coaches, initially it takes about two hours a week per consumer time while someone is learning to provide coaching because that includes supervision. Um, if you do have a program that already provides pearls, adding engaged coaching would be really easy. They're very similar skills. Um, so the next slide is just an invitation to stay connected. This is my lab. We love our pets. During the pandemic, we brought them to our meetings. Please do stay in touch and I will turn it over for Q&A. Great, super. Thanks for all those amazing presentations. I'm I, obviously, we could spend much more time on on each of uh, on each of your topics, but I appreciate the highlights today. So I'll just have a couple resources through Engage to share. Um, you can see our website URL, engagingolderadults.org, on the bottom of the screen here. We do have a new manual that we um, recently released on implementing and expanding virtual programming for older adults that I thought folks might want to know about. We've also recently updated and relaunched our community awareness toolkit that has a variety of um, customizable materials, including a consumer brochure and um, infographics and fact sheets and a sample PowerPoint and much, much more. We also have a social engagement innovations hub. If you're looking for ideas for kind of locally replicable social engagement programs and a variety of other resources on our website. So I just wanted to pl plug some of those items. Um, next slide. We also, um, are involved with an initiative called Commit to Connect, which is a campaign developed by the Administration for Community Living to combat social isolation and loneliness. Um, US Aging serves as the coordinating center for that initiative. Um, and you can find the URL on the screen as well, committoconnect.org. But um, one of its key activities is developing a nationwide network of champions who care about addressing social isolation and loneliness, whether you work at the local, state, or national level. So if you are on this webinar and you're interested in connecting with others who also care about this topic and having some kind of online dialogue and access to other events and opportunities, you might want to visit that website. Um, but now we will segue to the Q&A where we have just a couple minutes, but I think we'll have time for a couple questions. So I'll invite the speakers to come back on camera. And I've been monitoring the Q&A and thanks to the presenters who I, I see met, um, you've been engaging in the Q&A online. I think I'll start with a um, specific question for Susan and Constance. It kind of gets into some of the details that I think our webinar participants are, are are interested in. But it was from somebody who's looking at doing more with pearls and is interested in your work with the Opal program. And um, that person was asking if you can tell any of the background on, um, I guess, why on, on why you didn't stick with pearls. But also, if is Opal supported by the 3D Older Americans Act Title 3D federal funding? Um, and who are the coaches administering the OPAL program? Are those trained volunteers? Are they paid staff? So if you could just get into a little bit more of that background, that would be super. Um, it is not funded through 3D because it's evidence informed and not evidence based yet. And um, the coaches are our behavioral health specialists. So they're professionals that, that are um, <clears throat> working with our clients. But Susan can address more about OPALs versus PEARLs because we still do both. Uh, at our AAA. Um, thanks, Connie. So 
um, because of the amazing support that receive, we receive for behavioral health, we were able to continue providing the PEARLS program. So we provide both PEARLS and OPAL. Um, and also we have trained um, both a community health worker and an outreach worker in um, two counties on the coast to do PEARLS. So it, hap it just happens that we have um, two people who are, who are social workers, counselors um, by education, um, but this is also a program with OBL that can be replicated with um, non-behavioral health staff. Um, Does that so answer the question? I, yeah, I believe so. Just a quick add-on. Um, how, so how many staff do you need to, to, I guess, run OPAL for the number of consumers that you currently reach? Or if somebody's looking to replicate, kind of like, what do they need to consider getting started? Um, right now, we have, we have two full-time. Okay. Over on the coast, they have one part-time um, community health worker who's in a uh, fairly qualified health clinic that also offers mental health services. And then in the other county, it's an outreach worker who also is part-time. So it really is going to depend on um, the agency, their budget, and um, their staffing issues. Mm -hmm. Great. Helpful, helpful context. And PEARLS as the evidence-based program perhaps is funded through Title 3D, but OPAL as the evidence of form is, is through the other funding streams. Um, I saw another question come in that, Mike, you had responded to a bit in the, in the online Q&A box, but perhaps not everybody um, saw that answer. So I was wondering if you could share um, in response to the question, um, what can you recommend for older adults who are less likely to leave their home um, due to declining physical health. You had shared some examples, I think specifically from some of the work in Illinois. Oh, sure. Uh, we've already mentioned virtual programming and I think many of us became more adept at virtual delivery of evidence-based programs uh, such as chronic disease self-management, matter of balance, just to name a few. Uh, also volunteer-based organizations have engaged volunteers in being friendly visitors, providing um, telephone reassurance, calling, uh, well-being checks. So I think volunteers are, are critical uh, in, at the neighborhood, at the local level. Great. Would anybody else like to add on with other you know, programmatic examples they have in that realm? I know that's a, perhaps a broad question, but Kim, it looks like you were going to chime in. Yeah, I was going to add to the the volunteering piece. Um, I was lucky enough to um, uh, run a randomized trial of senior core volunteering, and we were lucky during the pandemic to be able to enroll people who um, we wouldn't have been able to enroll before uh, because they were homebound and unable to leave the home. And we were able to successfully pivot so that all of the volunteer opportunities could be provided in the home. So um, we had people who did the friendly calling themselves. We interestingly even had some people who were both receivers of friendly calling and providing it. So the pandemic was a real opportunity to test that. So stay tuned in a year, we'll have our results of this trial. But we did, um, we took around 300 lonely older people and randomly assigned them to do a senior core volunteering or um, a self-guided reminiscence to see hopefully that being that volunteer, like Michael mentioned, can be an antidote for loneliness. That's great. Um, I saw another question come in uh, on the OPAL program. So I guess back to you, Susan and Constance, but they, this person was interested to know, you had mentioned a resource database that you'd started focusing on later in the project. And they were curious to learn a little bit more about that and what kind of data points you collect, if, if you can share a little bit of detail there. Um, it's more of a, of a, resource collection mm -hmm. so we have we have our own database we have been tweaking that as we've been tweaking the program so that's one part of a question in terms of our database the second part is that um, we have been researching resources since the very beginning and before this program started we could send out through you we have a like a five page, eight page list of the categories of resources and the connections. So like the phone number, the website that we give to every participant. Um, and they're a little different in terms of activities, senior centers, um, emergency contacts. Um, we have a great program called Ollie that offers classes online to older adults. Um, and then a number of other programs 
both peer counseling, phone call, uh, warm lines, and then um, housing and all, all the other urgent care needs. So we could share that with folks. And that's what mm -hmm. um, Connie was relating to in terms of part of our program and OPAL is really being creative and learning about what resources people are needing, how to access them, and also how to find them. That's great. Um, well, I see our my East Coast, Coast clock here has now struck 2 p.m. So I want to be um, acknowledge that we have hit the end of our time mark here. I always wish we had more time for Q&A, but I did place your contact information from your slides into the chat. So um, you may get some follow-ups from folks here on the webinar who I think have been very interested in what you've had to share. Um, so I did want to make just a quick closing um, to thank you to our presenters for your really amazing and so such content rich presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for all the attendees who joined us today. Um, you will get access to the recording, the PowerPoints um, probably early next week on our website. We also have a brief survey that we that we do after each of our webinars. So if it'll it should pop up on the screen as we close out. So if you do have a chance to do that, it'll probably take less than two minutes of your time. We also do a brief three month check in on each of our webinars. So it, it, you know, as, after a, that little stretch of time goes by, you'll see an email from us in your inbox just to kind of check in on any continued learnings from the from the webinar or how it may have applied to your work in the time since. So just don't be surprised by that. Um, and then you can go to the final slide, Allie, which is also our contact information. But if you're if you're just able to navigate to engaging olderadults.org, that's where you can find all of our um, information. So with that, we will uh, conclude and we're so appreciative of your, of your time and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.